So I have to say that um, I've never spoken in such a large crowd before, and um, I, I was sharing with Balsam Mama and Shirley, I might just die of a heart attack <laughs> before this. So, uh, but thank you for praying. I know there are a lot of lot of you here, and um, a lot of my sisters and my family back home that have been praying for both Viji and me as um, as we bring to you the word. And so. Although um, it's with great fear and trepidation I'm standing here, I am grateful. I'm definitely grateful to the Lord for an opportunity to, um, to share with you today. I know there are so many here seated that I would have loved to, hear, to have heard from. I was so blessed with all the testimonies and I would have loved to have heard from so many of you. But having been given this chance, um, I'm grateful to just, just glorify the Lord uh, among you today and it also gives uh, me so much joy to just direct our thoughts um, and our hearts to uh, to our Lord Jesus the one who loved us and died for us um, so just I'll just pray before we start father Heavenly Father I'm so so thankful that you are here in our midst and that you um, <coughs> You are so um, you're so kind and gracious to us that you, uh, you you meet us right where we are and you you speak to us and you you speak um, you speak truth to our hearts. We thank you for your son, who you love, who who's your beloved son, whom you gave us so freely. And Lord, I pray that as um, as uh, as I share today, that you would protect me from any error. And then I pray that uh, for our dear sisters here too, that your spirit would direct their hearts, Lord, exactly where you want them to be. And I pray that your name would be glorified, and that it is not unto me, but unto you be all glory. We ask this in your name and for your glory alone. Amen. So uh, our theme for the conference has been walking with Jesus, and I figured I'd stick to that. Now, I made a mistake. I did not check to see what Viji was using with references, and I realized that uh, he was speaking stuff that is part of my notes. So, so I was talking to Shirley about this today, and she said, well, then that is the Lord directing us, you know? So I, I, I'm just going to leave it at that. But so he, he said, you know, this term walking with Jesus, what, what, does that, what does that bring to mind? And we put that question out to our Wednesday night, uh, but, you know, prayer meeting. We have, we have a small group prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. And uh, the first thing that really came out from ev for most of the people was Enoch. Enoch walked with God. And um, so we said, yes, that's right, because you read about it, that Enoch walked with God and he wasn't found uh, because God took him. And then we dug deeper. And uh, we, we, so what does it really mean? Okay, Enoch walked with God, but what does it mean to me? What does it mean to us as women? Um, and as we dug deeper, as, as Viji pointed out, it's uh, what we're talking about is basically life. It's just everyday life of a Christ follower. And I, I use the term Christ follower because the term Christian is used so loosely in our circles, in our, in our, in our age. And so uh, how does uh, the everyday life of a Christ follower look? So for me, the one thing that stood out was um, about the life of a person who walks with Jesus is knowledge of him. Knowledge of him is the one thing that stands out of, in, in the life of a person who walks with Jesus. Now, I'll confess much to my embarrassment, when I was a teenager, I had a much older, very godly cousin who, from time to time, every time we met or he came home, he used to ask me, Joyce, how's your walk with God? And I was a young teenager at that time, and I, I used to be so afraid of him because I, was, I knew that was the question he's going to ask me, and I'm like, I really don't know what to tell him. And it's kind of, I used to dread that question, how's your walk with God? Because I, I knew he's going to ask me that. And I realized only later why I dreaded it. It was because my knowledge of God was limited to the Psalms because, you know, as you grow up in, in, in Christian homes, you know most of the uh, Bible stories. I mean, we know from the major things that happen from Genesis through Revelation. You turn to the Psalms usually um, as a vending machine when you really want help when you haven't studied for your exams and you say, Lord, help me, like David is crying out for help. And so that was my knowledge of God. And that is why when he asked me every single time, how's your walk with God? I used to dread that question. Now, our Lord is so gracious in that even when my knowledge of him was limited, it was my experiential knowledge of him was, was limited, he, draw, he drew me close to himself. 
prompting me to study his word so that I might know his heart. And as Fiji said in the morning, Amos 3.3, can two walk together except they be agreed? How can I agree with the Lord about sin, about anything, if I don't know him? If I, if, if I just have a head knowledge of him, I think Ben mentioned it on the, um, on the, um, for the one of the plenary sessions, is it just enough to be saved? Is it just enough to have this head knowledge of him? Or rather, if I have a relationship with the Lord, it constitutes, it's, it's, it's about knowing his heart. It's about delighting in what pleases him and being sensitive to what displeases him. So as I thought about these things, uh, there's so much to share, but what has been most on my heart is just for us as women to be st intentional students of the word, just studying God's word for ourselves so that we may know him. And so that has been on my heart. Now, I know some of us, or most of us, have opportunities to be part of some really good Bible studies, and BSF is, is one, one really good example, and I praise God for that. Uh, these studies, a lot of time, are facilitated by teachers uh, outside of our local assembly, and we are, I'm definitely thankful for godly women who, who teach and, and sound biblical doctrine, my heart has been burdened about the local assembly and the equipping of women in the local assembly. Somehow there's an idea that uh, doctrine and theology is for the men. I don't know if you agree, but that's been an idea. That's been what I've been hearing. And generally, uh, I'm older now, and that's what I've heard as a child. Doctrine and theology is for men. Oh, we just, the women just need to keep home. You learn how to be submissive to your husband, and you learn how to cook a few things, because the way to his heart is through his stomach. And um, that's what you generally hear. But I'm going to disagree. Uh, I'm going to say, you know, when you look at uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, all of us know that verse. Paul tells Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to, to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that charge, I believe, is not just to Timothy, but to every man and woman who calls herself a follower of Christ, who calls herself a disciple. In Titus 2, and all of us know that verse, older women teach younger women. Now, older women teaching younger women or training younger women, we've kind of, again, narrowed that down to very uh, simple, simplistic things, but I, I do believe there is a charge here to teach even in the things of God, as in doctrine, to teach, teach younger women doctrine. So... Um, how could we teach younger women uh, or train younger, younger sisters in the Lord if we're not studying God's word for ourselves? So just this past month, we had a, a retreat that our, our church was out to, and the topic was discipleship. And one thing that stood out that, for us was that there is a huge lack of intentional discipling in our circles. And that need is very great. And when asked, what are the hindrances? So we asked some of the women, what are the hindrances? What's hindering you from, from discipling another woman, a younger woman? And the one answer we got is, well, I don't know God's word enough to teach it. And so that has been on my heart. And as I was praying when Shirley asked me, I just felt the Lord prompt me because it's been on my heart. And I, I feel like this is my, my heart for you as well, my sisters here. And I want to extend this vision to you as well, that, um, that we would be about studying God's word uh, for ourselves so that we might know him. And in doing so, we start training our younger women. And we pass the baton so that generation to generation pro can proclaim the works of our God, okay? So that's, that's been our vision. So, to walk with Jesus, I must know him. And with this in mind, I thought we'll stick to Ephesians. Even, you know, we've done Ephesians among, in our women's Bible study as well, and we just loved it. Uh, so I thought we'll stick to Ephesians, and I'm just going to take that small passage from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 to 20. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 to 20. Uh, we do have it on the PowerPoint as well. Uh, so uh, we can, yeah, I'll just, I'll just read it out. So Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, Ephesian believers is that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, 
and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to what as who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right, right hand. So if we had to break that down, Paul's prayer is basically this, that we may know him, that we may know what is the hope of his calling, that we may know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and that we may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to it as who believe. That God would grant us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Think about that for a moment. That this awesome God would reveal himself to us. That he would even want us to know him. To know him intimately. To know him deeply. I was reminded, and I think Viji mentioned it in one of the workshops too, about in the Far East, about how kings... Uh, they built walls around their pa palaces lest the common man set eyes on them. Or if, if the king were to pass, the man, the common man had to bow his face so that he could not even look at the king. And yet we have this awesome God inviting us to know him, to be, have a deep experiential knowledge of him. That's just astounding to me. And as I thought about that, I thought knowing him involves knowing his character. That's, that's a huge part of knowing him, involves knowing his character. So what, is, what does the Bible tell us about him? Now, we all can, can come up with so many answers really quickly. He is gracious. He is kind. He is merciful. He is good. He is holy. He is just. He is loving. He is faithful. He is forgiving. And so much more. And our lives on earth would not be enough to know everything about him. That reminded me of that verse in Jeremiah 9.24. Can we turn to it? Jeremiah 9.24. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. I absolutely love how the Lord is telling us that we can boast in the fact that we, can, we know him. Notice how it says, boast in this, that you understand and know me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, righteousness in the earth. What is that? That's his character. I was also reminded of Psalm 51, verse 1, and you don't need to turn to it. I'll just read it, where David says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. Notice how God, David falls on God's mercy to blot out his sins. He appeals to God's character. Now, we know the background of that psalm. He had committed a heinous crime. And he has the audacity to say, have mercy upon me, O God, according to, according to what? Not according to anything I've done because I, I don't deserve mercy. But he says, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. That, that involves knowing this God. He, he knew his God and he knew that if God says he is merciful, he will be merciful. And so he falls to God's character. And he says, you have said you're merciful, and so I fall to that. And so our mandate is that we might know him. We might know him through an intentional study of his word for ourselves so that when Satan tries to deceive us into thinking that God is not kind or God is not loving, we go back to the Bible. And based on the truth of Scripture, we can say he is kind and he's good, and he can be trusted. He can be trusted. He can be trusted in every circumstance of our life. So we walk as those who know him through the study of his word. Then Paul says that we may know the hope of his calling, that we may know the hope to which he has called us. What is this hope? I know that most of you will know right away what is this hope we have that he will come, that he will come to take us to be with himself. And where do I find it? I find it back in the scripture. It's in the Bible. All of us have to go. That's our manual. We have to go back into the Bible. And we, the, the, the beauty of it is God speaks to us 
in, in like the littlest things of our life, and you might think, oh my goodness, how did I find my answer here? I never thought I would find my answer in the Word, but God will speak to you through the reading of His Word. And so um, how do I know that, uh, what is this hope? It is that He will come to take us to be with Himself. First Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. That's where we know about the Lord's, and, and other passages too, I just picked this one, about Him coming. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, ab about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by, by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This passage was read at the gravesite for my dad's funeral six years ago. And standing there looking into the grave and listening to a dear brother preach so powerfully from this passage, I couldn't help but rejoice in this hope. Oh, we knew that dad was more alive than ever now. And we also knew that based on the authority of the word of God, we will see dad again when the Lord comes to take us to be with himself. And our hearts were encouraged with that knowledge. And so we ought to encourage one another. Don't live as those without hope. Another passage that came to mind when I was thinking of this hope that we have is that we will be like him. We read that. When he appears, we will be like him. And we see that in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as, as he is pure. We will be like him. I must confess, I don't understand what that means, because all I can think of is our corruptible sinful bodies. And all I can think of is the sin nature. And one, during one of the workshops as we were, we were talking about what it is to have the glorified body, uh, Valsamama brought up that we will have a sinless body, and that's exciting, that we will have a sinless glorified body. But to say that we shall see, uh, when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is, I don't understand the fullness of, the, of this verse. But because God's word says it, I believe it. I believe it. That word hope, really, when we see what is the hope of our calling, that word hope is not a hope so, like, oh, I hope I get this job, or oh, I hope my children do well at school, or a hope so kind. It's not that. It is a hope with an assurance that this hope will be fulfilled. And how is that possible? Because our God doesn't lie. And if he said it, he will fulfill it. So what does that hope do for us then? Personally, I like to have a practical ex ex application for myself. I'm, I'm, I'm very simple in my thinking. I'm like, okay, how do I make this real to me? How do I flesh this out for myself? And so all the, you, don't, you won't see this mentioned in my practical ap applications that I give you for the next uh, two points as well. You won't see that specifically in the prayer, but when you read the other verses, this is what I understood, that it should motivate us to walk in holiness and purity how it says in 1 John 3, 3, everyone who thus hopes purifies himself as he is pure. So it should motivate us to walk in holiness and purity for his glory. And next one, that we may know what is the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I love how these words are framed, that we may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. For a second I thought, whose inheritance in whom? God's inheritance in the saints, because 
we always think of our inheritance. We have Christ as our inheritance. But this is, we may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, God's inheritance in us. In chapter 1, as you see all the blessings that, uh, that Paul mentions, in verse 14 he says, We are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. But here, it's God's inheritance in the saints. So it's hard enough to comprehend that God would consider us to be his inheritance, but even more mind-boggling as you think of it as a rich and a glorious inheritance. So as I considered this, I was thinking of the Old Testament, and I thought of how Israel, Israel is considered God's inheritance. And you read that in Deuteronomy. Uh, you don't need to turn to it. It's De Deuteronomy 4, verse 20. It says, But the Lord has taken you, speaking of Israel, and has brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own inheritance. And then you also read in Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 to 8. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you are the fewest of peoples. But it was because the Lord loves you and is keeping that oath that he swore to your fa fathers. So that's with Israel. Now what about as the saints? We can look at 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. I'm sure you, as, as you're all going through scripture in your head, you thought of that, where we are a, um, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So I'll read that for you. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the ex excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not obtained mercy, but now you have received mercy. So whether it was to Israel or to the church, his bride, notice it was not because of anything in us that we should become his inheritance, but it was because of who he is and his sovereign will to set apart a people who will be his own. Why? That we should be to the praise of his glory. Again, I thought, okay, so his glorious inheritance in the saints, what does that mean to me? And as I thought about it, I wondered, if God considers the saints to be his inheritance, what must my attitude be towards this inheritance? What must my attitude be towards the saints? Remember, he's referring to the church, Christ's body. I do believe this should motivate us to walk in love and humility with one another. Motivate us to walk in love and humility with one another. There are so many verses that talk about the one another, that relate to the one another. You see that in the epistles. And, the, and maybe if you'd like to do a study, um, you, can, you can go ahead and start with a study and, and, and you know, figure that out. But as I, I, as I thought about it, I was re reminded of Ephesians 4, verse 2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace in verse 32 as well be kind to one another tender-hearted forgiving one another as christ as god in christ forgave you so we walk in humility and love with one another in the body of christ so that we might glorify him and lastly that we might know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to it as who believe again Paul uses so many words just to say power. Just power would have been enough because we're talking about God's power here. But I believe the Holy Spirit directed Paul to put those words, those extra words there for our benefit, just in case we don't believe it. We needed those extra words. It is a power that is immeasurable and great that we may know the immeasurable greatness of his power to it as who believe. As you read further down, Paul is explaining this is the same power that God used to raise Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand. It is that same immeasurable power that saved us, that raised us from, from, from uh, death to life, that quickened our dead spirits, that brought us from darkness to life. You see, in um, I think uh, Tinka mentioned it in Ephesians 2, uh, we were dead, and we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and we went, once walked following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, but God, 
but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ my point here is that it is the same power that brought us from darkness to light that made us alive together with Christ and it is the same immeasurable power that will keep us as we live. It is the same power that will keep us. How do I know this again? It's through his word. Second Peter 1, 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and God, God, godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. His divine power has granted us all things, all things that are necessary for life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him, that we might know him. There's so many verses that will attest to this truth that God's power is enough, is enough and will help us to overcome temptation, to persevere through trials, and to keep us to the very end. How do I appropriate that power to my life? Um, I believe it's by knowing, by believing and applying the truth of God's word to my everyday life. So I believe here the charge is to walk in victory. We walk in victory. Now God has empowered us by his Holy Spirit to walk and live in victory. I'm not sure about you, but as I thought about this, this, this specific verse, I felt like, I, you know, I don't really appropriate this in my life, you know. So much of the time we depend on our own power to do so many things. So much of the time we say, oh, I got it. I can take care of it instead of depending on God's power. And I can say that for myself, too, just in speaking here, too. It just frightened the life out of me. <laughs> but I, I just felt like I had to obey the Lord here and, and, and say yes. And it is his power that is helping me even stand here and speak. So I feel like a lot of times we live in this, with this area, we live in defeat. We don't live in victory. We live in defeat. Take, for example, the issue of worry. Have you fretted over something so much that there is absolutely no joy or no evidence of God's power in your life? I know I have. So as many of you know, Vijay has struggled with fibromyalgia and, and, and all that goes with it. And I remember every single time both him and I desperately turned to the Lord regarding his health, God graciously strengthened us with those familiar words from 2 Corinthians 12:9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, unless I believed and spoke that truth to myself, I would have lived in constant worry and defeat, not able to see God's power is made evident in our weakness. I was talking about this verse to one of my dear friends, someone who's very passionate for the Lord and yet very aware of the nature of her flesh and how it can bring her down. And I loved how she put it. I said, hey, how, what does it mean to you to have the immeasurable greatness of God's power in your life? And she said, this immeasurable great power is working in me daily to make me to be like Christ conforming to me to be into his image. I agree. It takes this immeasurable great power to conform this sinful heart, to conform this sinful person to be like Christ, but it is God's power. And so whether it, whether it is to bring to submission sometimes pride that is lurking in our hearts, or whether it is the besetting sin of worry or an unsubmissive spirit, or whether it is the strength to go through a trial with our health or just with a prodigal child, or just the courage to share the gospel with somebody you love a lot or someone you don't even know, whatever the situation is, it is we need to know this immeasurable great power and in order to know it I have to speak God's word to my heart I have to counsel myself with the word of God pray that God would enlighten our, the eyes of your heart to know this immeasurable great power that has worked in our salvation continues to work in our hearts to conform us to, into his image which is our sanctification and which will work for our glorification. And so we walk in victory for his glory. 
And so, my dear sisters, let's walk with Jesus by being students of his word and thus know him. And as we know him, we may walk worthy of this call by walking in purity and holiness, by walking in love and humility with one another, and by walking in victory with his power so that his name is glorified in our midst. May God bless this to you.